Um, I'd like to welcome everyone who's joined um, to this Integrative Medicine webinar, which is a collaboration between the Young Doctors Movement and also the Integrative Medicine SIG. So just a little bit of information about ourselves. We're, a, we're Wonka World's newest SIG. We started last year and we are, our vision is to be in line with the WHO traditional medicine uh, strategy um, and to promote uh, the use of traditional medicine, complementary medicine and alternative medicine into uh, the, the, in the medicine that we practice as family physicians. And the WHO, um, are, their aim is to develop proactive policies and implementing action plans that will strengthen the role of traditional medicine and what it plays in keeping a population healthy. Uh, and we're, we're very lucky today uh, during this webinar because we are joined by three fantastic speakers from across the world. We are joined by um, a Dungso um, or Indigenous Dr. Karma Ugin from Bhutan, who is a chief physician at the National Traditional Medicine Hospital in Timpu, Bhutan. She's also studied in India and Thailand and has been integral in developing a comprehensive mental health treatment guidebook collaborating with both the local healing and spiritual health professionals and psychiatrists. Her contribution to medicine has been um, uh, uh, recognized because she's a recipient of His Majesty's Certificate of Appreciation in 2019 for her what commitment. Um, also, we have Gigi An from um, Hong Kong, who specializes in promoting women's wellness throughout every stage of life with traditional Chinese medicine, also known as TCM. Uh, incorporating herbal medicine and acupuncture she uses TCM's distinct perspective on healthcare to address an array of gynecological conditions effectively. TCM has been a mystery and seen as a non as seen as non scientific for decades. Dr. Sonia, you're on mute. Please unmute. Uh, Sonia, 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 you're, you're yeah, muted. muted. Sorry, apologies. So apologies for being muted. Um, just to go back to um, Gigi, um, she believes that uh, she's dedicated to empowering women with the knowledge to understand the transformation their bodies undergo at different life stages. Gigi believes that this understanding is a cornerstone of healthful journey and long lasting wellness. Finally, but last but not least, we have Dr. Amber Mushtaq. So Dr. Amber is a family physician. She has a private practice in Karachi, Pakistan and delivers holistic care to her patients. She has completed her FCPS training from Aga Khan University Hospital and later passed MRCGP International. She developed um, an interest in traditional medicine and has pursued a diploma in cupping and is a certified therapist in hijama therapy. Soon after the COVID pandemic, she attained a diploma in herbal medicine, and her research interest is traditional medicine and its safe practices. Um, I'd also like to thank Anna and Aldo. Um, Anna is our Spanish interpreter today, and Aldo is our Mandarin interpreter today. Um, just a few housekeeping rules as well. So um, if you are not speaking, if you can keep yourself on mute, um, there is a translation function, as we mentioned, and there is also caption that if you'd like to have captions, there is a caption um, function if you press the more button as well. Um, so just to kind of go back to our integrative medicine um, groups, um, um, special interest group, um, we will keep um, our um, contact details within the chat function. Um, you are welcome to um, ask us questions in the chat function and we will have questions towards the end and that will be adjudicated by Vishnu. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we're just hoping that you will very much enjoy the webinar today. So thank you for your um, attendance. Um, I'd like to pass over to our first speaker, Gigi, if she's ready. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen first. So, I think everyone can see the screen, right? 
So good evening, everyone. It's my honor to join you here today. So our journey today is to explore how, how traditional Chinese medicine helps you to maintain your health to prolong longevity. So I'm Gigi, and I'm a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner in Hong Kong, and I'm specialized in women's health and also in reproductive medicines. So let me begin with um, Sorry, Gigi, you need to unmute, please. Gigi, I think we lost your voice. I think you're muted. Yeah, muted. Okay. So let me introduce myself again. So I'm Gigi, I'm a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner in Hong Kong, and I'm specialized in um, women's health and also in reproductive medicine. And let me begin with how, um, what is the fundamental difference between the traditional Chinese medicine and the Western medicine, especially in terms of the principles, diagnosis, and also the treatment approach. So when we talk about traditional Chinese medicine, um, TCM in short, we are referring to a holistic approach to health. This means it feels we feel the body, mind, and spirit are interconnected. And when one part is unwell, it affects the whole. So this is the interconnection and is the core of TCM's approach. So TCM usually uh, we will use what we call the four pillars of diagnostic techniques that includes um, observation, listening, and smelling, asking the patient's history and touching or palpating the body, particularly um, the pulse. So this comprehensive method gives us a holistic view of how a patient's status of the health. And in terms of treatment, and TCM employs a variety of techniques to restore the balance within the body. These can include herbal medicine, acupuncture, dietary therapy, exercise, and more. The goal is to not just to treat the illness, but to maintain the balance and prevent health problems before they even start. So on the other hand, Western medicine often focus on treating the symptoms. So it seeks to identify and address a specific problems and usually use the found diagnostic tools such as X-ray, ultrasound, and MRIs. So the primary methods of Western treatments is our drugs and surgery. While these can be very effective and they are generally used to tackle specific health problems after they have occurred. So in summary, while Western medicine tends to focus on managing their specific symptoms and traditional Chinese medicine takes a more holistic approach, um, emphasizing and uh, the prevention of a disease and maintaining the overall health. So in TCM, usually we use the four key techniques to gather the information of a patient's health. So we known as four pillars of diagnostic techniques. And let's dive a little bit deeper into each one. So first we have inspections. This involves observing a patient's spirit, behavior, the facial color, and the tongue. The tongue is particularly important in TCM because its color, shape, coating, and the movement can give us important clues about a person's health. For example, a pale tongue might indicate a deficiency, while a red, very red tongue could suggest there is heat in the body. And the second pattern is um, um, hearing and smelling. And hearing refers to when we listen to the sounds from the patient's body, such as the speech, breathing and the sound of their cough. Each of these can reveal different aspects of a person's health. So the when smelling is on the other hand involves nothing any involves the unusual body breaths, which may indicate a certain health conditions. And inquiry by asking patients about their symptoms, medical history, lifestyle, and everything like in very detail, emotional status, sleeping quality. So because in TCM, we believe that a person's lifestyles and emotional well-being can greatly impact the physical health. So these factors 
are very essential to our understanding of their overall wellness. And finally, we have a very traditional way to diagnostic a patient is palpations, which um is in um involved like feelings the pulse to gather the information of the patient. Different pulses in TCM indicated different imbalances in the body. It's not just about the speed of the pulse, it's also about the strength, the depth, the width, and the rhythm of the pulse. So in summary, these four diagnostic tools of TCM provide a very comprehensive and holistic understanding of a patient's health, going beyond not just only physical symptoms, but also consider the factors of their emotions and lifestyle as well. So in TCM, we feel the body as a whole interconnected system. It's not about uh, indivi uh, individual organs or body parts. We believe that everything is interconnected and the health of one part can affect the health of the whole. This interconnectedness extend beyond the physical health to include emotions and spiritual health as well. Harmony and balance in all aspects are fundamental to our um, um to our well being. So there are many factors that affect our health. So emotions plays an in um significant role, and negative emotions are negative emotions are like uh negative emotions like stress and anger or worry can disrupt our body balance and lead to health problems if not addressed. It. So um, there are environmental factors such as weather, the seasons, our surroundings, environment. These can also affect our health in different ways. And TCM can address a very wide range of health diseases. For example, pain such as headache, menstrual cramps or joint pain. So we have different methods that can help and also digestive problems like indigestions, constipation or diarrhea can be elevated with the right treatment. Respiratory issues, stress and anxiety, infertility, skin conditions, and also insomnia, even chronic fatigue sym symptoms can be uh, managed effectively with TCM. So the approach of TCM is varied and holistic. Herbal medicine, for example, use natural herbs to restore the balance and treat the disease. Acupuncture, um, both body and facial ones, involve inserting needles into specific points to stimulate the body healing process. And moxibustion involve burning um, a specific herbs near the skin to warm and invigorate the flow of qi in the body and dispel certain um, phacogen's influence. Cupping uses the suctions on certain points to promote the blood flow and relieve the pain. And massage or uh, turner manip manipulates the body to relieve tensions and promote healings. So, um, so we have specific tea as well for the home daily use. So for, for them to prevent different disease. And finally, TCM also provide guidance for weight management, helping people achieve a healthy weight in balanced and sustainable ways. So TCM offers different wide range of tools and techniques to support the health, well-being and, and, and emphasizing balance, prevention and holistic care. So Acupuncture is a very key part of traditional Chinese medicine, but how does it work actually? So imagine your body is a network of invisible pathway and almost like rows. So these pathways are like are what we call meridians and they carry cheese at the vital energy that keeps us alive and well. So however, sometimes there's traffic jams. So acupuncture through the insertion of the needles into a specific point of these meridians. So it's like a traffic um, officer clearing the jams and allow the chi to flow freely um, again. So these help us to restore the balance of yin and yang, the two opposite but complementary forces in TCM. So what are the benefits of acupunctures. First, it triggers to release endorphins. 
our, our body natural painkillers. So it makes it very effective for pain reliefs. So it also helps to regulate some neurotransmitters. So which plays a big role in our mood and stress level. Second, acupuncture has a calming effect on our nervous system, helping us to switch from fight or flight to rest and digest um, um, form of being. So in other words, it helps us to activate our parasympathetic nervous system, which to help us to relax and recover. And interestingly, some papers that the acupuncture has also found to cause a shift to our brain wave pattern from beta to alpha, so which help us to relax. And let's talk about um, facial acupuncture. So it's not just about looking good, but feeling good as well. So it stimulates um, collagen productions, which keep our skin looks firm and youthful. And also it enhances skin quality and boosts blood circulations, delivering more oxygen and nutrients to your skin so that um, we look less puffy and more absorbed of our moisturizer. And also it helps to reduce um, under eye puffiness, lessen the appearance of the fine lines and also aid um, in healing the acne and the acne scars. So the body acupuncture on the other hand can be used of wide range of healthcare purposes, more general, such as detox, relaxation, pain treatment and sports injuries and pre uh, rehabilitations or pro-operative rehabilitations like uh, pro-stroke treatment. It helps to recover faster or promote the, the, the joint movement uh, immediately after the stroke. So these two can apply a wide range of health issues. So um, that is for spot injuries. So we usually add a little bit of electricity on top of the needles to assist the um, effect of the needles. So acupuncture serve a very powerful, is serve as a very powerful method in TCM promoting the balance and well-being and healing in the body. So I will talk about briefly about what is cuppings. Cuppings is another key technique in TCM. So cupping works a bit like reverse massage. Instead of applying pressures to the muscle, it uses the suctions to pull them upwards. So this can be done in two ways. So one is quickly heating and then place a glass cup on top of the skin, which create a vacuum as it cools. So by um, sucking up the, the, the skin. And also the other one is to use a rubber pump to create the vacuums and in the plastic cups. So either way is fine. But um, the, 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 the function of the cuppings is mostly a uh, helps to activate a uh, healthy blood circulations to remove the unnecessary waste from the body and to draw to help to draw out the excess fluid and because of the heat we used during cuppings it helps us to remove the coldness and dampness from the body so usually we applied it after a people getting sick so it helps them to recover faster and lastly Cupping is excellent for muscle relaxation, as we all know. It's just like a massage. It helps to relieve the tension in the muscles so that it speeds up the muscle recovery after a workout by increasing the blood flow, which brings more oxygen and nutrients to the muscles while helping, to remove, helping the muscles to remove the waste from the body. So, so what is how what is TCM? Um, the, the, the theory of it. So imagine uh, what we are doing is imagine your body is like a battery. So you know how over time a battery loses its charge. So similarly, our energy level or our life force, what we call the body in, in TCM, also get depleted when we age. So just like how different batteries have different lifespan. So each person's battery life is a little bit different. So what are the things that drain our battery. So um, working too much without rest can consume a lot of energy. Poor rest, stress management can also drain our body, use up all the energy to cope with stress, lack of sleep for sure, lack of exercise, poor eating habits. These are the, 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 the things that will drain our battery 
and makes our body get sick more faster than the other people at the same age. But here is the good news is, it's like how you recharge a battery. You can also recharge your body by, by different ways. First, um, food therapy definitely is a good way to use in daily life. So eating a balanced diet provides your body with um, nutrients, it, what it needs to function well. So consuming foods that are in season also beneficial as these foods are at the peak in terms of nutritional values. So eating warm foods rather than cold ones can help to maintain the balance of yin and yang in the body. So avoid eating the greasy, fried um, fast food, and that can prevent us from building up toxin or blockages in the body. So drink more water to keep your body hydrated. And finally, the most important is sleep. So sleeping before midnight allows our body to align with the natural uh, rhythm in the body. So providing us um, optimal rest and rejuvenations. So in essence, through healthy lifestyle choices, you can recharge your body battery and promote health and longevity. So now we're talking about um, women's health, how TCM helps um, with women's health, which is our strength to do that in our daily practice. So in traditional Chinese medicine, a woman's life is seen as a flow of a cycles of seven years, which means in seven years, we deplete a little bit. So during childhood and adolescence, we are focusing more on the kidney chi, which is um, for focusing on the growth and development. So which provide abundant energy to fuel these processes. In that adulthood, what we are focusing will be shift to soothing the liver chi because um, during liverhood, we have to involve managing a lot of emotions and stress. So it's also a time that many women may experience pregnancy. So TCM encourage women to take a good care of their body during each day, including after miscarriage and postnatal healing. As women move to adulthood, so we will focus on the other thing like spleen, stomach, and kidney yin. So these elements are associated with nourishment, with overall vitality, which help them to transit to perimenopause from perimenopause phase to menopause phase very smoothly without any complications arise. So TCM um, often offers a guidelines for maintaining a healthy menstrual cycles. So usually in daily practice, we usually ask the patient to come to us on day five of the menstrual cycles, which um, during the follicular phase, which is the uh, golden time for us to replenish our chi and our blood during the time, and also to nourish the kidney and the liver at that time. So for those who want to get pregnant, we definitely ask them to come over during this period of time. And during and after menopause, that's another phase of the menstrual cycles, which will promote the blood circulations and also to help them uh, uh, um, to aid the ovulations so that they ovulate in time and then to make the uh, menstrual cycle very healthy in the, in time. So there is a uh, in each month, there is a menstrual cycle checklist that can be helpful for us. So what we are looking, not just them, whether they, they have period or not, we also look at the length and the duration of each cycle and also the amount of the blood of the menstrual cycles to assess the overall health. So we go very detailed into each woman's menstrual cycle, whether they have blood clots or not. So common menstrual cycles problems like irregular periods, cramps, infertility, endometriosis. So these often can be addressed with TCM holistic approach. So, uh, so it's very critical, crucial status for women to build their strong body stronger um, on day five of the menstrual cycle as and also like the crucial status like um, perimenopause, mis miscarriages and postpartum is also the time that we pay a lot of attention to a woman's. So during this um, transitional time, if a woman can take care of their health like smoothly at this time, so we bring the harmonies of a woman's health to so prevent them to, from building up uh, lots of different diseases in these stages. 
So here are some food therapies that we would recommend to our patients, especially after their, um, after the period, because usually they will ask us what they want to, what they can eat to um, prevent disease or to nourish themselves. So usually we will ask them to drink some um, uh, free days tea, like to nourish themselves after the period. And from period, um, from day fifth. 13 onwards, which is their ovulation phase, we will give some herbs for them to drink it as a water to improve the water retentions and also to improve the blood circulations. And if they want snacks, some to replenish the kidney chi. So we will offer them some sesame ball. It's like a snacks, so very easy for them to follow. Not only acupuncture and uh, herbal medicine, but also some daily like food that they can take um, after they go home. So in different seasons, we offer different recommendations of the herbal teas. So for example, for winter or for autumn, where we offer some dry pear because there is quite dry in Hong Kong during those seasons. So that helps to nourish the throat. As, and also after COVID, we may also offer those kind of teas so to nourish the throat and promote the recovery of COVID. So lastly, there are some health tips for the women or even for men. So usually we would recommend the patient to, to start um, the day with a cup of warm water. So it helps to activate their system every day when they wake up so that they, the day will be recharged and then you can like sustain the daily activities. And that's the end of my presentation. So thank you for joining me today. So I hope this information is helpful. So please feel free to ask me any questions afterwards. So I will try my best to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. Um, that was a really interesting talk and it was really helpful to hear about the principles of TCM, which is to do with the interconnections and seeing the body as a whole and restoring balance. And um, I really enjoyed especially how you used TCM um, and integrated it into the medicine that we practice um, dealing with. Estoy viendo una del, estoy... um, dealing with um, yeah, sports injuries and stroke rehab rehabilitation and period management as well, which is, I think, a really excellent way of doing that without the use of medications. Um, and I was really interested to see how sleep um, and your diet was really important. And I, I think we all know that there's increasing evidence to show how important that is in your daily activities and improving your body battery as well. I really like that analogy. Um, I think what we'll do is that we'll leave the questions um, towards the end after we've had all three speakers talk. Um, but if you do have any questions, please do place um, place the questions into the chat um, uh, and then we will ask them on your behalf uh, to the speakers. Um, so next up is Dungso Karma Ugin from Bhutan. Um, we're very lucky to hear about the indigenous medicine practiced um, uh, at the traditional uh, National Traditional Medicine Hospital. And I think this is the first time I've um, spoken to someone um, about uh, Bhutanese medicine, so I'm very excited. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Karma. Thank you so much, Dr. Sonia. Kususambo and a warm greeting from Bhutan. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm very much delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you all about the topic uh, towards the holistic health integration of traditional and traditional medicine with allopathic medicine in Bhutan. Well, uh, many of you, uh, since many of you comes from diverse background and region, you must be, uh, you might be familiar with the traditional medicine practices unique to your culture, whether it is Ayurveda from India or Sawaripa medicine or traditional Chinese medicine or indigenous healing ritual from various parts of the world. Traditional medicine holds a rich tapestry of knowledge that has been passed down from generation to generation. Simultaneously, modern medicine has developed its approach to health with scientific rigor and precision and innovations. To be frank, uh, fully integration of these two systems seems impossible to me 
but uh, yeah, however, a partially integrated uh, can provide more holistic way of the patient care. So uh, with this, if I start my presentation, uh, these are the points that we will be going through today. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to uh, introduce what is saw ripa. Uh, the traditional medicine in Bhutan is known as saw ripa, uh, which is uh, believed to be taught by Lord Buddha in the form of uh, medicine Buddha before 2,600 years ago in India. Later, uh, this medical tradition was uh, brought to uh, Tibet by Guru Pema Sambhava in the 8th century. And the former rural of the country, uh, known as Shabdung Nawanamge, brought this medical teaching from Tibet to Bhutan uh, in 1616. That is how the uh, Sawaripa flourished in Bhutan. Uh, moving on, uh, we will be looking on the conception of traditional medicine system in Bhutan. Uh, since the effect of uh, med natural medicine has gained its popularity among the Bhutanese society uh, by forcing its contribution to the nation, the third king, uh, Jimmy Dojo Onshu, has issued a royal decree to establish a traditional medicine uh, hospital in Bhutan. Uh, it was in 1967. And that time, during that time, there were only two physicians working in that hospital. And uh, yeah, after four years of establishment of the uh, dispensary, um, uh, they have uh, formally started a clinical assistant training in 1971. Um, and the uh, uh, TM physician training program was officially started in 1978 and has been ongoing ever since. In response uh, to changing time and needs, the Faculty of Traditional Medicine has uh, initiated a master program in traditional medicine in the year 2000, uh, yeah, 2017. So this is the brief history uh, of traditional medicine in Bhutan. Uh, since uh, today's uh, topic is on integrations, so um, consequently, uh, we will be viewing how we integrate traditional medicine and modern medicine in Bhutan. Since the, these both the systems are functioning under one roof in Bhutan, we have a good collaboration and integration between these two systems. The integration between traditional medicine and modern medicine in Bhutan represents a holistic and culturally respectful approach to health. And this model driven by the policy support, educational initiative and practical implementation showcase how both medical system can harmonize and complement each other, enhancing overall, overall health outcome for the populations. If I talk about the policy framework that support traditional medicine in Bhutan, uh, first of all, uh, uh, in the constitution of uh, Kingdom of Bhutan in 2008, uh, in the article 9.21 states that the state shall uh, provide free access to basic public health service in both uh, modern and traditional medicine. And in the economic development policy of the Kingdom of Bhutan 2016 states that enhance the indigenous medical research development base and be the center of excellence for the uh, education in traditional and in traditional medicine. As per the national health policy 2012 of Ministry of Health, that should be an achievement of successful integrated well functioning traditional and modern medicine. In Bhutan, traditional medicine units are incorporated into district hospital and basic health units. 
This setup allows patients to receive both uh, type of treatment in a single visit, fostering a more comprehensive and convenient healthcare experiences. This facility ensures that patients can choose the type of care they prefer or need, enhancing patient satisfaction and outcome. Coming to the patient referral mechanism uh, between traditional and modern medicine. Uh, in Bhutan, we have an effective patient referral system known as cross-referral cross uh, system uh, between traditional medicine and modern medicine. Patient referral can be made both ways through the electronic patient information system known as EPIS. And also additionally, we maintain a WhatsApp group uh, that includes both modern doctors and traditional doctors to facilitate the communication when we refer the patients. So uh, both the modern medicine doctors and uh, traditional medicine doctors, we sit together and we have developed a form, referral form. So when we refer the patients, so we have to uh, fill fill up that, that form. So hey, here I came up with few examples uh, that uh, few examples of the field form. So this is uh, the patient from modern medicine to traditional medicine, the referred patient from modern medicine to traditional medicine. This patient uh, was referred by the psychiatrist for the uh, combined management. And uh, this patient was uh, referred by the, I think, orthopedic uh, surgeon for alternative medicine and procedures. And uh, this patient is referred by the neurosurgeon, Dr. Tashi Tenzin. Uh, this, uh, the condition of the patient, uh, I mean, this patient is referred for the therapy. We have very effective therapy known as um, yeah, hot oil compression therapy, which is, which is very effective uh, for the headache, giddiness, insomnia, anxiety, and depression. So our modern uh, medicine doctor knows that therapy very well. So that's why they used to uh, refer this uh, type of patient to us. So if I uh, give you a few examples of the patients, we refer to modern doctors. So this is one condition. This patient came to me on, uh, I mean, with a big lump on the neck. So uh, that time the patient was bleeding and uh, patient was uh, so much in pain and they came to us uh, and expecting us to do bloodletting from there, uh, that lump. So when we examined the patient, uh, we found that it need immediate uh, modern intervention. So immediately I referred this patient uh, to modern medicine. Uh, so I felt this patient need immediate uh, intervention from modern medicine. So later, this patient found out to be a cancer patient. So with the cross-referral uh, system, so patients are getting uh, treatment uh, in the right time. So this is the case of hypertension. And then we used to refer the uh, high blood pressure patient to the modern uh, hospital, allopathic hospital. And this is case of allergy that we referred uh, to modern hospital. Okay, now uh, coming to the research development part. Bhutan encourages uh, scientific research to validate traditional medicine practices. Uh, last year, the Faculty of Traditional Medicine launches the Bhutan Sorik Journal uh, on 17 December to provide space for researcher and scholar to discuss and disseminate their findings. It is a peer-reviewed journal meet, meeting the standard of scientific publishing. Where, uh, where this, uh, the, this peer-reviewed journal is shared by a uh, modern doctor, Dr. Tashi Tenzin is, uh, mm, sorry, Dr. Karma, Dr. Karma Tenzin is the chair of this uh, peer review journal, so which indicates uh, it's a prominent presence of integration. 
And the integration emphasizes patient choice and individualized care. And patients are empowered to choose from traditional treatment to modern treatments or com combination based on their needs and preference. For example, some patients are taking uh, uh, allopathic medicine. And uh, if, uh, if the symptoms such as insomnia and headache and anxiety are not subsiding by that uh, prescribed drugs, they uh, used to come to us for the um, yeah, hot oil compression therapy. So they can uh, uh, do uh, the combination or combination based on their needs and preference. Now, uh, let me take through the diagnosis in traditional medicine. Diagnosis in uh, Sawarikpa is more oriented towards the way of knowing and understanding the process of disease and its, its roots, then identifying the microscopic qualities of the specific pathogenic organism. It, it is achieved through three key methods. As Gigi uh, has highlighted, Dr. Gigi has highlighted, we also follow this uh, three key method the physical examination and uh, touch and uh, yeah, detailed history taking. So in phys physical examination, we do trunk examination and urine analysis. So the way we analyze the urine is, uh, we um, advise the patient to do some diet restriction prior to one day of, the, uh, one day of collecting the samples. And then we don't add any you know, reagent in the urine. We just uh, uh, analyze by um, uh, looking at the colors, odors, bubble, cecums, and the, the sediments of the urine. And then we do also detailed pulse reading and to confirm the diagnosis. So our uh, National Traditional Medicine Hospital have different type of therapies, which, uh, which is very effective uh, for uh, subsiding the pain. We have around 23 types of therapies. So here I have listed few for your kind reference. So first one is the gold needle therapy. So this therapy is uh, given by hitting the gold needle, needle. So we have a specific therapeutic point for this. We don't insert the needle inside. We just give the pressure heat from outside. And we have herbal bath therapy, and we have bloodletting therapy, venesation therapy, and we have steam applications and nasal medications. We have also cupping therapy, herbal steam bath, horn cauterization, hot oil compression, and moxibustion, horn suction, and we do also have uh, silver needle therapy, and we have acupuncture services too. Uh, as a part of integration, the Royal Queen Mother, Geyum Tsringpem Ongchu, um, directed us to uh, establish uh, TM palliative services uh, at the oncology ward at JDWNRH. So uh, establish uh, TM services in the modern hospital ward. So oncology ward where the uh, cancer patients are treated with chemotherapy. So um, these are the prioritized TM therapy. So we have prioritized acupuncture, hot oil compression, massage, varieties of herbal compression, gentle massage along with heating therapy, cupping therapy, dry cupping and massage cupping. If I uh, tell you brief, briefly about the indications, since everybody knows that the acupuncture is uh, proven for the pain management and also it is very effective uh, to reduce the side effect of chemotherapy. So we used to give, give this uh, therapy to uh, at the oncology ward. Uh, we have uh, one Dungso, one doctor uh, at the um, oncology ward there. So he used to uh, conduct all this therapy to the oncopation after the chemotherapy. 
And this is the very, uh, the one uh, therapy, the uh, one I have, I'm uh, talking earlier, uh, the hot oil compression therapy, which is uh, very effective for the giddiness, headache, and tinnitus, and insomnia. And this therapy also very effective on anxiety and depression. So we have different uh, wind point on the head. So this is this, uh, the medicated bolus is heated in the sesame oil, and then we do uh, give pressure on the uh, therapeutic points. And yeah, and massage, uh, I will not go into detail since Gigi has uh, already highlighted on the um, indication of the massage. And also uh, we have uh, prioritized uh, herbal compression therapy uh, uh, at the oncology ward. Uh, this therapy, uh, I mean, this therapy is um, uh, specially uh, to uh, manage the pain. This comprises of two types hot hot compression therapy and cold compression therapy which relieves uh, crime relaxation and assist and improve improve blood circulation and stimulate internal organs and this is uh, cupping therapy this therapy also we used to give to the onco patients to reduce the pain so I will not go into the detail of indication since uh, Dr. Gigi has already highlighted. And then uh, this is the um, Sawaripa based uh, meditation and exercise. So um, to the caregiver, uh, for the caregiver at oncology ward, uh, we used to, uh, the TM focal person, the palliative focal person there used to conduct this therapy sometimes uh, to uh, promote happiness and well-being by focusing on management of mental and physical health. Now, uh, I'll be showing the detail on how we collect the herbs and process of making medicines. Uh, traditional medicine in Bhutan have uh, two collection center, one at the high altitude uh, mountain and one at the low uh, low altitude. So this is the picture of the high, high altitude medicine collection center, uh, which is located uh, at an altitude of 4,600 meters above the sea level. So the medicines are collected from there and it is uh, cut into pieces and then we dry it in the sun like that. And we do have greenhouse there also. And the medicines are transported to the nearest motor road through Pony. It takes four days to reach the nearest motor road. And yeah, it's very uh, difficult <laughs> to collect the raw materials of the traditional medicines. And now let me show you the finished product of the traditional medicine. Uh, currently we have 123 essential drug leads in eight forms. So our medicines are in the form of powder, pills, capsules, tablets, syrup, and medicated butter. And we do have also ointment and yeah, we do have syrup, syrup too. And uh, for the commercial product, uh, we have around 25 product a commercial product. The popular products are herbal tea, turmeric capsules, and uh, Cody Plus and Cody Active. So if I tell you about the uh, indication of the uh, popular supplement, uh, Cody, uh, the Cody Plus, which is made out of Cody Safe Sinuses, uh, this Cody Plus is uh, has it's a sort of general tonic. Uh, it it has a potency to restore the strength and rejuvenate, which means it will slow. It has a effect of slow aging and aphrodisiac, and it improves kidney and liver functions, and it will increase your hair and your skin radiance, and it will improve overall well being overall health and well-being. And uh, regarding the Cody Active, this is also made out of Cody Plus. This Cody Active have all the benefit of the, uh, which Cody Plus have, but additionally, it has uh, instant energy boosting in the spot or whatever it may be. Uh, yeah, and uh, it prevents altitude sickness. So, um, 
this is the capsule codi uh, codi active and yeah this is codi plus capsule now uh that's uh, that's all about the medicine and next uh, we have the current tm status of the uh, tm status in bhutan uh, in bhutan we have around uh, 81 tm units across the country uh, in in that unit, 56 doctors and 149 clinicians are working uh, in that uh, in 81 hospitals. So, uh, in district hospitals, uh, our traditional medicine units are attached with the modern hospital, and they are functioning from uh, under one roof. Only in uh, in the capital city and Thimpu, we have different hot hospital, JTW NRH and uh, National Traditional Medicine Hospital. Uh, so we have uh, two different hospital, but uh, since we have good collaboration and team uh, and uh, good cross referral, so we don't face any uh, problem in uh, yeah, referring the patients. But in the district, it is very uh, convenient for both the uh, system, the traditional, more traditional practitioners and modern pr practitioners. So uh, it is very convenient to both the uh, traditional medicine practitioners and modern medicine practitioners. So that this is the end of my presentations uh thank you so much for being with me throughout my presentations uh i would like uh, to uh, entertain clarifications and questions and i would like to um, appreciate your feedback too as i conclude uh, my presentation i would like to retract that the traditional medicine in Bhutan is most of the most sustainable system of healthcare as all the human resources are developed within the country and also all the traditional medicines are produced in the country. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, Karma. Um, that was a really fascinating talk and I I think one of the things I really took away from that is how in Bhutan, in Bhutan that the integration of traditional and modern medicine is written into the national health policy, which I think is fantastic. Um, but also I really liked what you said about how um, the medicine that you practice emphasizes choice and individualized care and that the patient is empowered to choose because ultimately, um, as long as the treatment is safe, um, what we want to do is empower the patient to make decisions for their own health, which I think is is fantastic. Um, I also really liked the fact that on the top of your referral forms, it says referral team MM to TM as a collaborative initiative, which I think is a really beautiful, beautiful thing to have at the top of your referral papers. Um, as mentioned before, we will be taking questions um, after our final speaker. Um, and I'd like to that now introduce Dr. Amber Mushtaq, um, who will be giving a talk about uh, her practice of hijama in and herbal medicine in Pakistan. Over to you, Amber. So, um, hello, good afternoon, or good, or good evening to everyone. And after a comprehensive presentation of all other speakers, I am Dr. Amber Mushtaq from Karachi, Pakistan. And basically, I am family medicine, family medicine practitioner as a primary uh, physician, and I did my diploma in herbal medicine and hijama therapy. Uh, that is a part of uh, wet cupping therapy, basically. Next. Uh, I have no disclosure and I have no conflict of interest. I am very thankful to uh, YDM and um, Spice Root to invite me so, for such an interest, interesting and interactive talk. So I will be more focused on my practice and the barrier and challenges what I faced in Pakistan and what is the situation in Pakistan about the traditional medicine and how this paradigm changed after the entrance of COVID-19 and some benefits of the herbal medicine next. So basically when I did my family medicine practice, 
my main aim was to provide the uh, holistic care to the MA patients. And uh, as in uh, uh, Pakistan is a part of Indus uh, civilization, the herbal and traditional medicine is an integral part of Asian culture. And many patients came through with the query about the home remedies, herbal remedies, what uh, and long way, long way back in 2008, when I did my uh, family physician practice, I don't know about that. Uh, but when I started my practice, private, private practice in my private clinic, so uh, uh, as a holistic care and give the patients a self body mind healing, I started my practice towards hijama therapy and uh, herbal therapy as well. Uh, and simultaneously, simultaneously, I want my patients to be more, uh, to give more bio, psychosocial, and spiritual model, um, model, uh, as it gives me a sense of complete care provider. Next, so what I practice usually when a patient came into my clinic, uh, as a practitioner, I take their complete history to know about the head to do, uh, things about them. I do physical examination that also gives us the feeling of touch, body, mind, healing to them. And also with allopathic uh, uh, practices of, as all uh, examination of all system, I also did tongue examination and pulse examination as part of PCM. I did my I did diagnose my patient with all these, plus I advised them blood tests and MRIs and radiology, all of them, so what they need. I lay them all the options, uh, what I experience in my practice. I counsel them about them, uh, these remedies to them and what the patient uh, care and patient choices. Then I gave them the option of herbal remedies, cupping therapy, reflexology, chirotherapy, physiotherapy, and not but least the diet and lifestyle modification as Gigi said is the integral part of holistic care. So what traditional practices of Pakistani population usually is, this is the this is not the latest view of 2020. Uh, most probably it is being changed after the you know, COVID paradigm. The, usually the patients were going through the uh, spiritual healing. More, most of the patients are going through spiritual healing. And as hijama therapy is the basic of their culture and religion, they are going through the hijama therapy because of this spiritual healing, most of them. And around 35%, they go to natural medicine or Eastern medicine, which uh, in, in part of our, our world is called Hakimi medication. 26% go to homeotherapy and the other traditional herbal medicine, acupuncture, aromatherapy, uh, less, less patients go towards them. Next. Uh, so what are the barrier and challenges when I started hijama therapy was not only the doctor's uh, perception because when I started my therapy in my private clinic, the doctor, uh, the doctor asked me uh, to talk, uh, are you a doctor? Are you a allopathic doctor uh, that, that that was the question which uh, disappointed me as well but because of patient centered approach and patient satisfaction i continue my uh, herbal medicine and uh, hijama therapy as well although 96% of the physician they were aware of hijama therapy and 72% expressed the desire to acquire knowledge as well even 56% undergone this therapy as well, but unfortunately, only 34.8% of the physician refer their patient to JAMA therapy. The next barrier is next. Uh, the next barrier or challenges which has not promoted integrated medicine or traditional medicine to Pakistan is patient uh, themselves. They even, they even didn't tell their doctors about they are going to the hijama therapy or they are going to spiritual therapy or herbal therapy. Even 50% of the uh, patient didn't inform their physician that they are taking herbal medicine. And when doctor uh, the doctor asked them about any side effects or any disease like diarrhea or any other side effects, they were just quiet. They were not informing them they are taking any herbal remedies. The third barrier is the traditional healers of our religion, which are called uh, hakims or which are called hijama practitioner. They're not even well trained and registered with the health authority. Although we are very good from the Earth Foundation in our Pakistan and since 
since the Pakistan is being independent, there are other societies as well. They they are trained. They are trained herbal practitioners. They are trained hijama practitioner as well. And recently, in last year, the government government of Pakistan has been registered hijama therapy only for the herbal physicians, not for the allopathic doctor. That is also unfortunate for us. Uh, so what hijama therapy does, I think uh, Gigi has been well defined that so we will move uh, forward and I'll go um, uh, uh, what I practice with this therapy next. So I, um, I came across many patients, it's been around more than 11 years I'm practicing. Most of the visits patient came was to suck pain. Because in pain, there's instant relief with hijama therapy and cupping therapy. And when I saw patients coming to the wheelchair and they are going um, barefoot, uh, they are going on foot. So it's an instant, uh, instant, uh, like instant relief for me to, to get hijama done to them and uh, to be more, uh, more, uh, more towards this therapy. The other things in which the patients have uh, many good effects are arthritis and headache as um, uh, last speaker said in headache, the traditional medicine has a very good role. And GIT tract benefit, uh, there are many gastrointestinal issues coming. There are many gastrointestinal issues coming across uh, in patients and hijama therapy with herbal medicine not only detoxify the intestine, it also decreases the stress because nowadays they are various functional gastro disorders coming even in children. Uh, 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 in sleep, uh, patients are not getting sleep. They are stressed for that they have many diseases at all. So pajama decreases the stresses by release of endorphin, by release of serotonin, by release of many other hormones which uh, increases the sleep and many other disorders like metabolic syndrome, diabetes, blood pressure. It's just gets relief only if we tackle with the stress. Uh, the main, most important thing I want to say, and these abscesses or skin loss uh, disorder, I I see I see hijama has got profoundest results. We just do dry cupping on abscesses, and it, the blood and the pus coming out instantly, and the patient has got released on on that clinic as well. Uh, same happened in the sinusitis. We do acupuncture of the sinus sinusitis. We open the channel with the JAMA therapy, with heat therapy, and the patient get cured. Next. Uh, so the, for the pain therapy, usually uh, the pain is due to muscle spasm or due to arthritis. Uh, so for doing with massage with herbal oils, as discussed with the last speaker, uh, it gets released, the spasm gets released, and we can apply tense or hot pack to them. And then we apply cupping therapy and the wet cupping therapy, as you saw in this picture, it detoxifies the blood, it increases the circulation. It does only the damp skin and stagnant blood come to the skin. It also gets rid of these toxic blood by means of pajama therapy. And after they go, they go home, we allow them them to take the medication if if uh, if there is a pain so we can allow them to take um, um, to take hot water to take herbal teas uh, which have the detoxic and pain uh, relieving effects like uh, healthy which is turmeric and other other medications as well next next is the most global disease diabetes the diabetes is not only the disease of pancreas, as we all know, it's the disease of brain, it's the disease of stresses, it's the disease of insulin resistance due to our body and muscles, which are not being uh, more towards the exercises. So after hijama therapy or body massage or cupping therapy, these muscles get blood circulation, they get heat up, and the insulin resistance is being decreased. So that's how hijama works on them. Uh, hijama stimulate the organs like pancreas. They also decreases the organ damage, which is being uh, done by diabetes. So all our kidney, uh, liver, heart, all being uh, detoxified and the blood circulation enhances. Even many researches on the, um, being done on dialysis patients as well, where creatinine was 4.4 and half hijama therapy, it becomes two. The same happened with other organs as well. As uh, so we did, I, I also did uh, give them some herbal remedies because hijama and these therapies are not being done on a daily basis. So when they get home, they allow us to take the fenugreek seeds. 
we allow them to take the black seeds with honey or uh, other types of honey which are non-diabetic. We give them java plum, which is very good for uh, diabetes. We also give them neem uh, and we also give them girmar booty that is called gym one, gym lemma. So all these herbal remedies which are present at their home which are um, uh, which are there in our culture, they can use them and they be aware of them and their diabetes is being managed. Next. Uh, so what happens after the COVID-19? It was a stigma. Patients were more towards the social media. Uh, the mind changing was being uh, was, uh, changed. Next. Uh, so, so many, many researches is being happened uh, with a check uh, uh, which patients are uh, taking home remedies. Uh, this is the um, uh, study which is being done, done in Dar es Salaam, where around 80% of the patients used home remedies uh, for the, the cure of uh, COVID-19. The other, um, this is the umbrella view in which they take about 70 systemic review where the patients themselves, the population themselves use herbal medicines without any prescription, just because they have their good effects on them. Uh, the other study in which around 32 countries were found in search of self-medication during the era of COVID-19. And uh, unfortunately, we see that India was the first one which used most of the herbs. And uh, it is a study of Saudi Arabia where they also use um, commonly utilized natural products and which natural products they were using. Uh, you were wondered about that next because the herbal herbs which were used for, uh, I, I'll tell you in other studies, this is Pakistan, in Pakistan studies because in last all uh, studies which have, uh, I uh, showed you in which uh, in, the, uh, in that Pakistan was not there. But I did study which was recently published in, uh, in an international art, uh, article journal, and it shows that 60% started the herbal remedies during the era of COVID-19, and 36% believe there's no additional preventive measure were necessary while using them. And that was red alert. They were not using any allopathic, any conventional medicine when we we're just using herbal remedies. And 81.3% of them were educated females. So this study highlights an urgent need for evidence-based healthcare intervention in Pakistan, especially when there is a risk associated with the improper use and potential influence from media. So which herbal uh, remedies which were they were using was next. Uh, these were basically the common uh, home remedies, honey, clove, lemon, eucalyptus oil, ginger, black seeds, black pepper. The other was licorice, uh, that is called this name, and, uh, and uh, haldi, that is called carpinoma longa. Next. The herbal man, man, remedies which I used and I search upon the evidence are almost same. They are ginger, garlic, or turmeric. This is licorice, which was also used 70% patients with uh, this systemic review. I mentioned the Canadian systemic review. Uh, Kushirin, this is was, was also very good effect of Kushirin, and it works as an antibiotic. Black seeds, as all we all know, onion, amla, cinnamon, it's thyme, cinna, galoi. Uh, olive oil, lavender, and chamomilla. Lavender and chamomilla, it's in, it's in most of my remedies because lavender and chamomilla has a very good effect in stress. Next. So these are some of uh, herbal combination which I made. Uh, I made the herbal uh, combinations uh, because in most of our uh, Hakimi medication or OTC medication, when they, they when we analyze them in laboratory, they have uh, steroids as well. So I started uh, I started analyzing all the herbal remedies which patients were using, and those remedies which are um, effective and which have no side effects and which have no bad products like steroids, then we usually ask them patient to avoid them. So these are some remedies for the patient's uh, uh, women health. They contain most of them. They contain vitamin D in the form of mostly. They come most uh, gum uh, containing parts. They are good for bone and they're good for uterus as well. 
The other uh, home remedy which I made is for GI disturbance, and they contain all kitchen products like Elaichi, Zira, Ajwain, Thyme, Sina products as well. The hair oil I made uh, because uh, many of my patients are females, they have alopecia problems because of stresses and because of GI disorder. So I made myself uh, uh, oil with aloe vera and onion and this is uh, the, th uh, the last one is a herbal tea this herbal tea contain licorice cinnamon uh, ginger uh, mint and also it contains lavender and chamomile it doesn't only gives the patient of soothing effect but it's uh, also good for the lung chi respiratory problem and uh, it's also good for women reproductive health and diabetes next uh, so these are the OTC herbal remedies. They are very good. And the most important thing, uh, the allopathic companies are pharmaceutical companies, which are most popular. They are also making these uh, products, which herbal, which herbal uh, components in them, and patients are using them, although they are very expensive. But the other components, like these are all herbal medicines, which are, we are using them. Doctors are prescri prescribing them. And OTC herbal remedies, they are present as OTC as well. Uh, so my next slide is uh, is summary of my presentation. Uh, as we all know, traditional medicine is part of our culture. Uh, most special uh, patients are going towards them, and it is cost effective, no doubt. In poor country of Pakistan, where resource resources are not there, where the patient cannot buy uh, allopathic medicine, and allopathic medicine have no effects most of the time because of stresses and other other lifestyle uh, imbalances. So in, in that time of era where Pakistan is suffering from uh, from economic part of view, I think in this part, it is our duty to care, uh, care the patient center approach with the integration of allopathy and traditional medicine. So. Thank you so much. Next slide as well. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Amber. That was a really fascinating talk. And I think you highlighted a lot of the challenges that doctors face um, uh, within integrative medicine. So lack of knowledge amongst lack of knowledge amongst allopathic doctors, patient not informing doctors, a lack of regulation and um, the need for evidence base, especially with improper use and influence from social media. And I think that will be an increasing problem as, as time goes on. And uh, also the fact that the pharmaceutical company have cottoned on to the fact that this is a growing market um, and obviously are making it into a multi-million dollar industry is another is another webinar in itself. Yeah. Um, I'd like I'd like to um, pass over to Vishnu now. Um, who will um, uh, will introduce the moderators and also take the questions. Um, I'd also just like to remind everyone that you can join the special interest group um, for integrative medicine. I'll repost the um, link uh, where you can join um, so that if you do want to do any uh, exchanges or if you want to connect with other um, integrative medicine doctors that we can we can um, connect you and we can become a growing special interest group. Um, so thanks very much and I'll pass it over to Vishnu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sonia. Uh, it was a very fantastic lecture given by Dr. Mujji of the Emperor and Dr. Kama. Now we... Coming up uh, from our site, the uh, first panelist I'd like to introduce Dr. Anam Shia. She's a family physician and palliative medicine consultant from Pakistan. She holds the position of the National YDM Chair for Pakistan chapter. And the second panelist is Dr. Asita. Dr. Asita is a general practitioner working as a medical officer in Sri Lanka and the National Chair of Spice Group Sri Lanka. And our third panelist is Dr. Aishna Joshi. Dr. Aishna Joshi is a family physician in part of wellness at Nepal. And she is the National Secretary of Spice Group Nepal and the recipient of the Family Medicine Early Career Research Award at Australia in 2023. I would like to uh, invite all the three panelists for the discussion. Uh, request, uh, we'll have two questions uh, for panelists.
Dr. Vishnu, should I start uh, with yeah, my question? Uh, okay, thank you all for very much, uh, you know, thank you very much for such great presentations. Uh, what I would like to say is that uh, each system of practice, whether it's allopathy, Ayurveda, traditional medicine, herbal, or any system has its own beauty, concept, principle, and philosophy. But the current uh, global practice that is extensively uh, accepted and widely practiced, that is the allopathic medicine, is highly focused on evidence-based practice and ethical considerations. Uh, as we all know, there are many literatures coming up every day. So my question uh, would be to Dr. Amber about, you know, her, who has seen uh, the both side of the practices, that is both the allopathic and the traditional. So I'd like to ask how uh, you uh, navigate ethical con uh, considerations while uh, prescribing traditional uh, remedies. I mean, how do you gain the acceptance and, you know, practicing, uh, you know, as, as, as uh, evidence-based uh, practice? How do you do that, Dr. Amber, please? Yeah, thank you, Vishnu. It's a very good question. Okay, how I ethically prescribe herbal medicine, you ask about? Uh, uh, yes, how do you navigate between, you know, like the ethical considerations? Because I don't, uh, do you have like as many literatures that uh, are available as in the allopathic medicine? So uh, how do you practice yeah. uh, the, uh, how do you incorporate or how do you practice evidence-based uh, practices uh, in, in while prescribing the tra traditional remedies? Are there any issues that you come up in your practice or is it just uh, you take it smoothly in day-to-day -day routine practices? Yeah, I don't think so. There are any harms of giving any medication like these are herbal medicines. Uh, even if I know there are side effects of them and I usually search uh, a lot about these medications. Uh, the medicines which we have in allopathy, uh, day by day, the side effects are coming up, even for aspirin, sometimes they are being banned, sometimes they are being um, uh, come up again. Uh, the same medication, the other medication which are coming and being banned, so most likely what medication patient preferred, what medication are evidence-based, and what medication benefited uh, uh, according to their temperament. Uh, so I think I go uh, towards the patient-centered approach plus evidence-based approach mm -hmm. to them. Uh, and I also uh, um, I also uh, inform patient uh, that I am giving you this medicine, so you must uh, uh, you must come up for me for follow up. You if you have any side effects occur, so I think uh, that is it ethical if you inform our patient that we are giving you this medicine. And I also show my patients all the ingredients which are there in these herbal medicines. Okay, do, so Dr. Amber, do you pre-inform the patients when you practice this, right? I think that is a very uh, good thing you pointed out, mm -hmm. that you pre-inform about the ingredients. Well, that's that's yeah. really great. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Can I can I ask you one more question? Yeah, yeah why not? Okay, so uh, I, uh, in, in Sanskrit, there is a terminology called arogya, which means the overall well-being uh, in aspect of health, uh, that is the mind, body, and spirit, and free yeah. from illness or disease. Mm -hmm. So being a family physician working uh, in a tertiary referral center of Nepal in a wellness clinic, I, uh, I'm generally concerned about all the time about the overall patient well-being and not just the physical ailment they have. I'm yeah. sure it's the same with uh, other primary care physicians across the globe, but in busy outpatient clinics, uh, of the hospitals, we are mostly concerned with the physical ailment and yeah. what much priority is given to the emotional, psychological, or even the spiritual aspect of the disease, right? So uh, so do you recommend uh, in the integrative medicine to be practiced alongside primary care and how can it be potentially integrated to the uh, mainstream allopathic health system? You are very right because uh, when I joined hospital recently, uh, there are a lot of patients waiting and they just want me to give the prescription. But as a family uh, medicine practice, uh, what I practice and I, I take you and uh, what my training was, 
not only cure the patient's physical disease, but their spiritual and biopsychosocial model. So it's just take five minutes to talk to the patient, ask the patients what is happening to them other than the physical illness, because psychosocial well-being is very common. It's uh, I think it's a root for all diseases. So I think the patient gets satisfied within five to 10 minutes. And if I think they want more counseling, they want more remedies, I will ask them to come and follow me. I give them specific time uh, for counseling. So I think that's, uh, that's being... Uh, uh, balanced with them. Is that okay? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think we should integrate alongside our primary care. That would be a great idea, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Amber and Dr. Shana. My um it was an exciting session. I mean all three um speakers have done so well with um uh, uh and it is so much to talk about. But my question is directed towards Dr. GJ. Um, Dr. Gigi, um, you mentioned a very important component of women health and infertility in your talk. I just want to know if there is, um, what is the referral system in TCM when you encounter patients with um, infertility issues? So would you like to take that, Dr. Gigi? Yes. Um, when they came to me, I will first ask them whether they are doing any Western treatment or not. If they just prefer doing traditional Chinese medicine and they just want a natural pregnancy, then we go along with that plan for three to six months. And then if they're not like still not getting pregnant, we'll ask them to go for a Western doctor to do some checkup and do some workup about like why they're still not getting pregnant so that to recommend them whether they want to proceed with the Western treatment or not. So I think in infertility in Hong Kong is um, the TCM doctor and the Western doctor are quite well cooperated as they all want to know about each others. And then also they're starting to get quite respectful about our practice as well, because some of our, because in Hong Kong, I think TCM is quite well accepted for the Hong Kong people. So that if um, usually when they go to Western doctors, some of them may tell the patient that they're doing some Chinese medicine treatment as well. And then some of the doctors saw the great results from us is for women who are taking Chinese medicine or acupuncture, they may achieve a greater result in their infertility treatment rather than just um those who are just doing the Western treatment along so that they want to know more about what we're doing and why we're doing so that we have a good collaboration in Hong Kong right now. So to see whether the patient wants to stick with the um, um, Western treatment, so we complement to the Western treatment. But if they want um, TCM as a dominant treatment for their infertility, we are also welcome for that. So... So either way, so they start with TCM just to replenish the body and prepare for pregnancy first, and then they go for Western treatment, or they fail multiple times in Western treatment, and then they come to us as a complementary way to work with their existing Western treatment. So these are how we um, integrate West and the East in Hong Kong, and then um, we're we're always quite uh, open in it in Hong Kong right now. Yeah, how we collaborate together. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank um, you very much. Slightly take my uh, chance. Uh, I, my question I'm goes sorry, to as, uh, as, as if uh, I'm just going to stop you for one moment, just because we are um at um sort of time. Um, I know that Cheryl just wants to have a few uh, wants to say something, and if anyone who needs to leave can leave and then obviously as uh, anyone who wants to stay for as if this question can stay um Cheryl would you like to take the uh, mic uh, and then if anyone needs to leave them please please feel free this will be available on the Wonka world um sort of site as well in the future thank you 
Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, I would just like to uh, say a few words. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Cheryl, and I'm a family physician working in Hong Kong, as well as the current Young Doctor Representative at Wonka. First of all, I would like to thank the host, Kinley and Sonia, and all the panelists for their amazing work and tireless effort in making this webinar possible, as well as our three distinguished speakers, Gigi, Karma, and Amber, who provided us with investment valuable insights from different perspectives of the traditional medicine, be it TCM or SOA Ripka or the hijama therapy. As family doctors, it's always important for us to keep an open mind. And we actually um, are aware that family medicine and traditional medicine do share a lot of fundamental principles, such as giving a holistic care, patient-centered care, and paying attention to the relationship between mind and the body. So this has been the second YDM collaborative webinar of the biennium. The Young Doctor Movement regularly hosts these collaborative webinars with different working parties and special interest groups, hoping to offer a platform for knowledge exchange and networking and to support our doctors in their career and leadership development. In addition to these webinars, we also have all different kinds of exchange program, the FM360 and also the Aspire program. If you're interested in our activities, please follow us on our Facebook and Instagram and join our regional YDM and participate in uh, all of our, our YDM pre-conference in different uh, Wonka um, uh, the, um, conferences. Yep. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. Um, I'll uh give the floor back to back to the host. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and what we'll do is that we'll ask as if we'll I'll get you to ask your question, and then we will. Uh, as you can see, some of the uh, questions in the chat has already been answered by the by the speakers in the chat. If you'd like to have a look at that. Um. All right. Over to you, as if. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um. Am I audible? Yes, I think you're audible. Yes, it goes to Dr. Kama. Um, thank you very much for a nice presentation. And uh, I know Bhutan has a lot of forest, and uh, the forest cover is a lot other than any other country in the world. So, how do you manage to find, uh, or do you uh, find it is challenging to find these herbal medicines uh, in abundant? Or do you have any challenges uh, in supply? Uh, thank you so much uh, for the question. Uh, although, uh, although uh, to be frank, we don't have uh, such study conducted in Bhutan uh, for the uh, raw materials, but uh, Due to climate change uh, and change in the weather pattern, or uh, early snow, sometimes uh, hail storm and all that uh, impact the uh, yield of uh, availability of the uh, medicinal herbs. Sometimes we have missed the season for the collection when flowers are blooming early or destroyed by the snow and hail storm. Uh, the collector have also informed us that uh, due to the globalization, uh, the uh, receding of the uh, snow line happens and uh, some herbs previously available abundance within their locality are now uh, available further away from their previous uh, site. And uh, delay seasoning, uh, or unpredictable uh, season also affect the bountifulness of the uh, herb. The only solution to this is to develop climate change mitigation me measure and domestication of in situ cultivation or propagation, I guess. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the questions. What do you share? Perfect. Thank you. Much. I think uh, I have <laughs> I have answered your question. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question from um, Ping Sun Chang asking: Do doctors in traditional medicine field also receive modern Western medicine training? And perhaps we can have a short answer from each of the speakers. Okay. 
you want me to answer this question? Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Uh, here in Bhutan, um, all the here in Bhutan, we are taught the basic uh, nursing skills, and uh, we are taught anatomy, physiology. I think, yeah, that's all. Beside that, uh, no, all we study is all in uh, Sawarikpa, the traditional medicine. So from the modern medicine, we study only the basic uh, nursing and uh, only the anatomy, physiology, and the research methodology in general. I don't know in other country, are they taught uh, all the syllabus of the modern medicine? I'm not aware of. So in Bhutan only, we are taught this much. How about, how about in Hong Kong, Gigi? Um, for us, I think um, in our university, we have um, different courses about the Western medicine, about different system. And also in my degree, we are going deep into what um, the Western medicine are doing. But then for practical training, we didn't receive anything, but we know the theory and what they're doing in Hong Kong. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. A number in Pakistan? Yeah, in Pakistan, basically, uh, for the primary doctors in MBBS, there's nothing to be like of traditional medicine, but for specialty like physiotherapy, there's a separate profession of physiotherapy where they train them about the uh, these cupping therapy and also all physiotherapy like uh, uh, acupuncture as well. Uh, and and, uh, and in skin diseases, there are well static clinic where they are going to have a facial cupping and uh, also they are training them a static micronutrient as well. As well but there's no as such traditional medicine uh, uh, university or any college in Pakistan. Sure. Thank you. And then one last question um, before we finish. Um, this was a question from Victor that um, was in Spanish and I've translated into English. So um, China has a lot to teach the world with its ancestral medicine. I suspect this is for you, Gigi. Um, what does it think about barefoot doctors and their work with traditional medicine? Sorry, can you, can you repeat the last bit of the question? Yeah, so um, China has a lot to teach the world um, about ancestral medicine. What does it think about barefoot doctors and their work with um, traditional medicine? Uh, breath work, right? So, so I think... Bare, barefoot doctors. So barefoot doctors are um, uh, not necessarily doctors, or, um, but they're sort of practitioners who go into like rural areas um hence the word barefoot mm, I, I think i don't know what this is in hong kong um, i think barefoot doctors are sort of rural healthcare providers um i think it's a colloquial uh, term for um uh people who um, not necessarily have medical um degrees but they might have some basic medical or paramedical uh, education um, I think for most of them, they're sorry. Oh my goodness! I think I think for them, they have some knowledge, and from their experience, some of their practices are quite useful. But then, in terms of like, um, some of them maybe is still in a myth. So we still need to like understand why it can works on some people. But then, if it's possible, if it's really possible to find out how why those kind of treatments works on people, then that would be perfect. But then if not, then usually we better just try to like avoid it, but follow the traditional treatments. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think that will bring us to the conclusion of our webinar. Um, I'm absolutely delighted um, that you're able to join us and I'd like to thank our esteemed um, speakers again that's uh, Amber, Gigi and Karma. It's been absolutely invaluable um, hearing uh, about your experiences. And I'd like to say one more thank you to Anna and Aldo, who has who have been quietly translating uh, and ensuring that our um, uh, webinar has been accessible to um, people who, are, who, who um, don't speak English as a first language. So thank you very much for your hard work. Um, as I said, 
for many of for we we are the special interest group for integrative medicine. If you are interested in find, further, finding more about what we do, um, if you could join our group, if you just join that link, and then we um you can sign up to um our special interest group, and we will be in touch. Um, so I'd like to say thank you one again. I'd like to thank Cheryl for her hard work as well, but I'd especially like to thank Kinley as well, who has been working very hard in ensuring that we have our meetings and that everything has worked um, impeccably tonight. So thank you, Kinley. Um, and that's all I have said. Everyone have a thank really excellent much. day. Thank you very much. Do we want to take a picture together? Yeah, that sounds yeah, a good idea. Of course we can. Yeah, if you, if you don't mind, you might switch on your camera. Uh, can maybe maybe Natalie from the audience? Natalie, please. Natalie, is your is your hand up? Hi. Yeah, Natalie, like, do you want to say something? Sorry, I don't listen to me. Yes, your hand is up. Okay. Well, um, I don't speak very well <laughs> English. Uh, I'm Natalie. I'm Peru. Uh, well, the experience here in Peru about the uh, medicine integrative, it's very, it's very nice about uh, here have a um, consultor, the medicine integrative in the, uh, in, in the Ministerio de Salud, the Ministerio for Peru, Peru Minister. And this this consultor is in, in all all the Peru in the uh, in the states or the uh, provincias here say provincias, and in this in this play um have a, a traditional uh, Chinese uh, is is one the 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 um well we are learning Spanish learning English. Aquí por ejemplo en Perú. Eh, se hace la medicina tradicional china. Here say the medicine Chinese. Eh, algunas cosas de la medicina tradicional eh, en, en la India también, también se realizan. Por ejemplo, eh, se hacen algunas cosas de ar aromaterapia. Here say the aromatic eh, in, the, in the place. And the people have a, a very, very good result. Here in Peru, um, high uh, institute to integrative. It's of the it's other play of uh, a uh, different for the minister of Peru, but this play have uh, uh, investigations about this the research. It's very good in in here. Uh, here in Peru, have the uh, cumbre cumbre international for the uh, MTCI, the natural traditional integrative. Uh, in the uh, 20, uh, 2021, have had the cumbre, but it's very interesting. But the 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 the, the but the problem is that we have a problem of idioma, no? Justamente el hecho de poder expresarnos en inglés como que nos limita un poco porque aquí en Perú no hablamos mucho. No es muy común que la gente hable en inglés. But we are in Peru have had the limitic because the people no speak English uh, in in the schools no na the the, the the people no 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 all the people speak in English and it's a uh, difficult with your express uh, and this uh, advance in Peru here about the medicine integrative no but it is it is all <laughs> it is all I speak and I have very 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 happy with it uh, confer uh webinar e thank you very much for all the 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 explanations thank you natalie i know natalie that you do a lot of work in peru with integrative medicine so i'm really delighted that you're here and you've given your time <laughs> to be here as well um so thank you um Right. So I think furthermore, I, I'm very sorry that we are 15 minutes overrun. I'm sorry, Cheryl. Um, right. <laughs> um, but yes, I'd like to say thank you for everyone for attending. If you'd like to turn your cameras on and then we can do a final photo just to yep. commemorate today. And then I will finally let you go. <laughs>